Welcome back to Eschatology Matters on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. I'm your host, Josh Howard. Uh, we're going to be talking about Christian arts, and I'm joined by a special guest today. But first, we want to mention Boniface Media. Boniface Media is a streaming platform from Grace and Truth Press, and Boniface is offering 50% off to 200 subscribers for the life of their subscription, unless their subscription's canceled or their payment lapses. So if you'd like to take advantage of that offer, please head over to Boniface.com, that's B-O-N-A-F-I-C-E.com, and enter the codes Alpha Test or Beta Test to apply your 50% discount. So with that being said, I'm joined today by... Uh, I don't even know how to introduce you, Ryan, but Ryan Lotario, who's got several titles and, and job descriptions behind his name. But Ryan, thanks so much for coming on and joining me today. Man, thanks for having me, Josh. It's it's good to be on. Yeah, that's all smoke and mirrors. All that's all it. smoke. <laughs> well, it, it's like every resume, right? Like it sounds like, you know, you run the world, but no, you do a lot of stuff. Would you give like just a little brief introduction where you're at, what what you've been up to, maybe how you got there? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um so I, I'm a I'm a visual artist. Uh, I'll do the the super fast flyby. Um, I always jokingly say I came to face somewhere between 1997 and 2004. So that's pretty a pretty broad window, yeah. The broader window, you know, depending on uh, what theology and how you understand salvation, you know, it was either in a moment or I walked into the kingdom and, you know, at some point became more aware of what was going on. But uh, yeah, so it kind of got saved out of the arts. Um, I was a, a painter and, uh, the more successful I was in California, the more miserable I was. So, uh, got married, um, uh, to a Christian woman and, uh, she was doing work at Biola back in the day, studying apologetics and, um, in, in her master's degree. And we went to, well, she did, I didn't meet her and she was doing that. We met and some, somehow along the way, the Lord saved me. And, and then, uh, I tried to start doing right by her and everything else. So, mm. Yeah. So we, um, had a passion for like culture. It's like, you know, you get saved and you're like, uh, naive and ignorant, the world's small and your ego's still big. And you think, well, gosh, there's no, there's nobody talking about the kinds of things that actually would penetrate and reach the culture. So my wife and I had a, an incipient burden to, to do something about that, uh, from a very uninformed place. So she, she does her, uh, starts doing her master's work in apologetics. And then I, um, uh, applied to the top 10 art schools in the country and got into several and uh, had already done a BA and an MA there in Sacramento. And so we went to Virginia Commonwealth University um, uh, it, with an eye towards moving to New York to see if we could do whatever it was we thought we were going to do, which wow. was not one coast to the other coast, man. One coast to the other coast, man. We had to get out. Of, shout out to all my friends in California, but I had to, we had to get out of California. It was right. not you know, for, for a lot of reasons. So, um, I got hired pretty quickly there, uh, based on the kind of training I received providentially in, in California. And, um, so I became a professor at VCU and, um, plugged into a church plant, like, like one of the first, if not the first new person to attend this church, uh, which is a whole story for another day. And, um, they had a vision for engaging in the arts. Pastor Brian was doing his, some PhD work at Oxford, but he was a construction worker and uh they had this vision for the arts need to be kind of um you know it was the old hunter idea faithful presence oh uh, yeah yep so it was this idea of like hey we gotta you know everybody was where they were at people were reading keller you know that kind of thing and it was like we got to do this and uh and i was thinking about going to seminary and they're like well we've we're building something and uh you know we might be able to train you in-house and we connected over time but our it was like we were four to different rock quarries and brought together to do do a thing Hmm. So lo and behold, that transformed our lives. Uh, we were uh, pregnant with my first daughter and decided to stay here and seek you first the kingdom and, you know, and forego um, celebrity. You know, I had opportunities as visual artists that didn't make sense as a Christian, but I was still trying to figure these things out. And so we started building here. You know, we just plugged into the church and kind of laid it all down. And the Lord sort of uh, opened up opportunities uh, that were confirmed by the church and, and, um, you know, kind of checked over as I was growing and maturing in my faith. So, um, we launched a nonprofit art space that became fairly effective and successful at raising people up that could navigate some of these waters. And then, um, serving as an assistant professor, I just obtained a lot of 
leadership responsibility just by being kind of halfway sane and responsible. And um, in the process, started to, started to work out what it would look like to launch an art and theology institute predicated on applied theology into, um, you know, as, D, as Doug Wilson says, th theology out of your fingertips into the making right. of so that, of course, of course, is so that that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I've done a lot of different creative projects and, you know, podcasts and different things. Uh, but that's at least a start. No, it's interesting. You were talking about kind of that that whole scene back, you know, the you had the Tim Keller kind of in the city for the city influence. And um, it seems like, you know, I've been in ministry for a little while and it seems like most Christians during uh, during my span of, of ministry have either had kind of two approaches. Um, there's either been the, you know, the very heavily I don't want to just keep using the phrase in the city for the city, but, you know, like very, very urbanite churches that like they would host art shows and like very intentionally art driven. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was familiar with that from a distance. I think most of the churches that we've been around, uh, Christians regard art as something not even worth investing in, has no eternal value. These things are just passing away. Why would we even invest in that? Um, it seems that there is a rich Christian history of engaging the arts. It seems like a lot of guys are trying to rediscover that, but like you were just describing, it seems like, like potentially tough waters for a faithful Christian to navigate at this point. What's, what's been some of your experience with that? Well, yeah. So if I could, just for the sake of, of the hearers, because I think, I think when we hear art, we think, okay, so if I could just lay it out, I'll lay it out this way. Um, so one, I think that the arts are pervasive. So when you, so, uh, meaning, um, I think Cal Calvin Searville, reformed thinker, um, has a lot to say about this. But you know, just a quick definition would be: the arts are the suggestion-rich symbolification of objectified meaning. Give that to me one more time, because that was rich. The arts are the suggestion-rich symbolification of objectified meaning. Okay. So to say it a different way, would say the arts are the aesthetic symbolification of objectified meaning. Okay. So. To go to go a step further, suggestion rich. Um, so so take take it as aesthetic. So take a tree. Let's just use a tree for a second. A tree is ontologically a tree, and then it's symbolified. We call it tree, but the nature of the tree excess, suggests more than merely itself. The heavens declare its glory. The earth is groaning. There there's something to be searched out in creation. So the tree is suggestion rich. Mm. What is suggestion rich with well, uh, you have to kind of goof around or stumble upon it to find out, right? So somebody figured out that trees can produce paper, log cabins, you know, your bookshelf. Mm -hmm. Along that way, the, the nature of the, 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 the ontological nature, the material nature, the form nature, and then the uh, suggestive nature lended itself to image of God bearers bearing the image or bearing the image of God properly, which is to search out and uh, unfold and unpack. Modern art, without lecturing too hard, has grabbed hold of all of these categories and pigeonholed them in a kind of Gnostic, Platonic way. And then what you see in the 80s is a kind of uh, punk rock rebellion against this kind of uh, modernistic pigeonholed on aesthetics and abstraction as the penultimate. And so they break into heavens, they break into the heavens and bring it down and start to appropriate it, which is what you see now with most people uh, in our kind of most woke uh, expressive state. Um, but, th but from a biblical standpoint, uh, the whole of creation is a symbolified, objectified meaning suggestion, rich, you know, he, he declared it good and he put us in there to work it. Well, if there wasn't something to work, um, then it would be like static and frozen. Mm -hmm. and if you think about like, even not to jump ahead, but you think about, um, the tabernacles are working at carving away at these things. They're having to work out of dead trees i mean there's a whole typology there you know there's right. a whole trajectory there of what happened and what could have happened and now what's happening and then what what should happen etc as we go forward so um when you see the arts are pervasive from the clothes you wear from the plate you eat off of you know from the books you read from the type typeface like i teach people that do a lot of things i'm a drawing area head so i oversee the drawing curriculum at a uni secular university not for not for much longer but um, you realize that there's nothing that art and design doesn't touch. Mm. You know, if you remove art and design from all that it touches, the stories you read, the typeface you read, the literate, like the house you're in, the street that's paved or not paved, the, you know, the stuff that you drive, the car you drive, the tractor. Um, once you remove art and design from all of that in imaginative thinking in a proper sense, 
we're kind of naked in a desert somewhere. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking as as you're talking, I'm thinking about the retrieval. You've seen a lot of, especially especially in reform circle, well, maybe not especially in reform circles, but you've seen a retrieval of the uh, either a Sabbath meal or just at least a once a week meal, the family meal, right? Like something that we didn't used to reflect on, at least I didn't. I never would have framed it as art. Um, and yet you start to realize like, okay, paper plates communicates. There's something more going on when you set the table, when you have the candles, when there's special, special meal, special things, it's actually communicating something to your kids and doing something different. Would that be kind of like a tangible example? Yeah, I think so. So I think that's great. And I think, I think that's a, a um, a right hearted and headed aim. Um, uh, the home is, I think the basis for cultural production. So it's gotta be rich there before it's rich anywhere else. Right. Yeah before your children and before before our Lord there intimately in terms of stewarding our responsibilities and what's been entrusted to us before it can ever actually be rich for society. And fatherlessness affects uh, culture building. So you see a lack of fathers uh, leading their children and their, their wives at the table. And, and then it's, not, it's no surprise that we see uh, paganism run wild in society. Yep. Uh, there's a gross correlation there. So I just like to make sure we capture a good definition of what I mean when I say art and design, because if not, uh, what the church hears is artists are like feral cats. And then, <laughs> you know, and then a good church puts a, a collar on them and a phone number and says, hey, if you find them, call me and send them home because we'll feed them. <laughs> and, and so the thing is, the church is the feral cats, but the, all the feral cats got to rep repent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that say they're an artist, the ones that say they're a plumber, you know, the ones that say they're a you know, home wife or, a, a, you know, all of us have to repent and submit to the Lord Jesus and get a grasp of what it actually means to be his people, you mm -hmm. know, what actually has he called us to. So if we're not talking about that, but we are maybe talking about you know, what I'm suggesting, and he's the Lord over all of it, then we can't afford to not have people over these spheres of influence. Um because if not, you know, we're we're basically dealing with what's acceptable, rejectable, or redeemable. Okay. You know? And so, you know, Netflix turns into pure flicks. And it's like, that's great. And and praise God that we can do that. There I have, you know, call it common grace. But uh, and we're passive in a certain way to that. And I don't think we need to outpace the culture or parody the culture. So I'm not even arguing for that. But what I am saying is that. Uh, the Lord's commissioned us to go there for, and we as passive recipients of his revelation and his commands then go. And in that going, I think he's given us a, a sufficient vision of what it would look like for us to be proper uh, artists and culture makers. Like you see in uh, Bezalel uh, coming out of Egypt, he's, he's filled with all knowledge and wisdom, filled with the Holy Spirit or filled with God's spirit, as it says uh, in the ESV, um, able to teach and devise every good artistic craft and design. And then he's commissioned to build the temple. Mm -hmm. Apple, right. Uh, the tabernacle. So like you're, you're seeing something in there. Uh, I mean, how much is, I mean, there's reasons why that are not to my point, but there's a decent amount of uh, page time or text time given to uh, Exodus around these, you know, I would seem like very important issues, yeah. even if they're primary. So the last thing I say is the arts are not ultimate. That's what the culture does. The culture makes them ultimate. So they worship and idolize them, but they are pervasive, you know, and then in sin, they become invasive. Mm. Okay. So walk me into like how, how the church, cause you'd mentioned, you know, as some of our correspondents before this, you'd mentioned a little bit about how the church has kind of missed it a little bit. And something you just said kind of keyed me in on this. So maybe you can help me walk through maybe how the church has missed it or we can avoid missing it or however we want to frame that. But um, so I grew up, you know, 80s, 90s, baby. Um, so I, I, I came up through the, you know, pinnacle of Christian music, I think in the last 2000 years. Um, so you had, you know, DC talk and, you know, all these just, you know, solid expressions of um, a little tongue in cheek, but still a lot of the, the Christian music, you know, I remember going into like Mardell bookstore, you'd pop on the headphones and, um, you know, see whatever uh, I'm really dating myself here, but you'd see whatever, you know, the, the new album was that was out. Uh, but a lot of it was just a mimicking of of what was around. So they they would you know the the sounds and sights of the the secular music or or whatnot. They they would just take that and kind of repackage it and throw some Jesus in there. And sometimes it was you know it was decent, but but a lot of times you, it felt derivative. It felt it felt like a like a a Christianized knockoff of what was around us. Um, I was just watching the other day. It was it was just one of those kind of like 
kind of funny moments. We were watching the new Godzilla movie. Um, and it was, it was so interesting just because it was done on a low budget from what I understand the, you know, the, the Godzilla monster was not just like breathtaking CGI effects or anything, but it was just a really good storyline. And I remember watching that with my wife and, and number one, it was like, okay, I, I don't even like Godzilla, but this isn't, you know, a compelling storyline, but also just secondly, it just reminded you that you can actually make good art. You can make good stories. And I wonder how much as the church or as Christians, we've kind of lost a little bit of that sense of. Um, not doing something derivative, but just something new, something or not even something new, but something beautiful, something truly, truly good and God honoring in the arts. But walk me into maybe how has the church maybe missed a vision of this or how can we recover that vision? What's what's that look like for the church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so true and beautiful is like a category people use. Um, I'm 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 good with that. And in a lot of ways, I have no problem. I won't debate people on that. Um I, I like to use um, true, excellent, and reformational. Okay. Um, As qualifiers for like good art. Yes, true, excellent, because it because it's not static. It's not a. Um, so you already got to you started dating yourself, and you know you you jump to music, and then you um, you know then we're jumping to Godzilla minus was it minus zero or Mon- yeah. yeah something like that yeah minus yeah. yeah. My son and I watched it. We thought it was a great story. It was refreshing that the story made you care about characters that you only saw for two seconds yeah so so here's something that i think that that movie accomplished one is it maintain a proper sense of gender as men and women in the movie yeah and uh the the second thing is it was very humanizing so i don't mean humanistic i just mean that um the image of god was um it was at least aiming in that direction let's say Mm -hmm. uh you know, not not superseding the effects of sin, but it just was aiming that way. You felt the humanity of the, the individuals in their gender, in in their maleness and their femaleness. And I thought that was very curious. And so, of course, it wasn't made in the United States. Right. Well, we wouldn't see that movie uh, made here unless it was a bunch of us got together and tried to do it and we're good enough. Right. right. Um, so excellence, I think I think you can unpack a lot of things underneath of uh, reformational, you know, the, the look of things. Um uh, but the church, um, there's a lot of reasons why. W- well, one is we're on a, a podcast called Eschatology Matters. I think eschatology has a huge impact on the making of things and how we understand the urgency of the making of things. Okay. So what kind of time do we give it to actually become good enough to where we're not predominantly parroting society? Um we may have to learn from each other, which may mean I, I may have to learn in Egypt, but I don't have to stay there. Mm-hmm. If I've been called out of it, okay, what's this look like redemptively? Like it's going to take more time and consistency. Um, it also has to be done in a way that doesn't land me in idolatry. So I, I think you have to actually pursue, you know, I married three kids, uh, a ton of artists that have gotten saved out of, out of our um local college I work at. It's the number one public art school in the country. Tons of artists have gotten saved over the last 17 years and are married and thriving and actually a part of the building of the institute, the the Maker Institute of Student Art and Theology that 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 we're launching in fall 2024. And so that takes time. That also means that sacrificing uh output, um, frequency and expectation for how it is that you're going to be known and seen or understood as a cultural maker, let's say. That means celebrity is way less likely. Um, but I, so I think that a vision that is wedded to a, 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 an eschatological vision of how the Lord's actually working in the world can uh, set the tone and um, the cadence for what it might look like for an artist, which mm-hmm. is why when you described working in your home and I said that that's the place to start, it's like casting a vision uh, that is accordant with where you're really at as a person in Christ and not you in envy grasping at something that the Lord's already died to give you, which I think a lot of Christians do. That's why you look at a lot of those, not all of them, but you look at a lot of artists that are musicians, like, like um, there's an extreme liberal drift because you've, you've latched on to secular culture as a, as a, um, a thermostat for you in terms of um, uh, what you should make and, and how it resonates with an audience. Um and there's an idolatry implicit in that, um, you know, it's waiting to spring. And so, I mean, you see like people like Derek Webb is, you know, completely gone, right? It was every, every musician from my childhood, I feel like every band, every Christian group, they all went that way. 
They all did. So, so uh, the church pastors need, I, I do think, you know, we have to have a, a grasp on the physical world matters properly. It's like, you know, I've, I've dealt with talking about these things and it makes people uneasy because it makes it, it, when you put light on it, it sounds already like it's idolatry. Like I'm saying, Hey, dye your hair purple and, and, you know, um, lose your life to X, Y, and Z, you know, however, um, the same pastor will, will make sure to include a quote from C.S. Lewis's great divorce. Um, so we get it when it's digested and proven. We're uncomfortable with it when it means discipling and uh, a person in our congregation, because we don't necessarily know like how that fits into a day in and day out walk of life. Right. Yeah. And and what you just said, um, cause you're touching on some big themes there. Like, you know, you touched on eschatology. I know we were going to kind of touch on protology a little bit or, or might, but I'm just thinking to, again, like the, the average Christian who encounters art, um, you, you, you just mentioned the material and the fact that it is worth something. It is worthwhile to engage. It's actually can be God glorifying. Um, we, we have a very, um, if not a Gnostic or a neo-Gnostic view, we have a very bifurcated view of the physical to the point, you know, the, the whole meme format of the, you know, they've got the the church building that looks just, you know, like a like a pizza hut or whatever. And it's, you know, with the sign stripped off and then the Gothic cathedral next to it. There, there's a sense in which I think most Christians would be would be very tempted, the person in the pew to say, well, it doesn't matter what the building looks like. It doesn't matter what we do. And that applies to a lot of th those expressions of art in this world. Um, yeah. I don't know if you got something to say to that or maybe a response to that even. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky because on the one hand, I think it's it's a little bit, it's an admixture of, um, you know, it's like a, a John 3, 16 urgency. You know, it's like if it's not if it's not evangelistic outright and I then I then I can't be bothered by that. Um, because we got to see people get saved. I think that comes out of a drift. I mean, I think it's something that Schaefer, Schaefer was, uh, in his Christian manifesto, was uh, pushing against and identifying, uh, you know, in like 1982 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is, um, when um, it's a false dilemma of extremes, either it's all like narrowly... Um, verified as evangelistic or we don't have time to worry about it right like it doesn't really matter but that's a sort of a a flattening of of god's good creation like j the heavens declare its glory i mean just a, a rich read of the scriptures and in a glance at creation would say otherwise um but i don't think we like the burden of knowing things mm -hmm. uh, because that because that puts us uh under the curse of uh, the garden um, where we have to work and that work is difficult and for most of us we just we're, i mean simply we're just bent away from work so work's already hard in the flesh and then you're you're troubling me with things that seem esoteric or you know disembodied i want easy sentiment you know i want puppy dogs and bunny rabbit posters in my grade school class and i like those um, but also definitely, I just don't think we know how wide reaching and impactful the arts are. Um, to put it a different way, if nothing is neutral, then everything, and I, I could prove this in, in actually like in a, in a very real way, everything, um, everything has an effect. The effects are not neutral. The question is, are they stewarded unto the glory of God or are they stewarded uh, away from the glory of God? Are they faithful unto the Lord? Or are they unfaithful and therefore dehumanizing? We're not really given a neutral in any area. Um, we may have relative levels of impact. Like I may walk by a flower and step on and say, well, what was the big deal? Mm -hmm. uh, but the flower wasn't a neutral. Um, it's just that you have the capacity to step on it. Um, but what's the accumulative effect of uh, anything? And given enough time, you start to find out. Right. So just looking around in our world, I mean, we're in 2024. Um, you know, you in Virginia, me in Michigan, there's, there's all the news scenes and the, um, there's an expression right now of what's valued in our culture and it's not great. 
um there, there there's an expression i would i would dare say of what you're describing of the arts kind of like this broader definition i think of the arts um people aren't out doing painting well actually some people are out doing painting but there there's there's a, there's a expression of what is truly good and and worthwhile in this world what is ontologically beautiful and it's not great how, how does the christian grapple with that in 2024 like what are we missing in the church that we can um you know we're not going to have a painting class necessarily but like what is it that we do to encourage this view of the arts as a Christian? That's a massive question. I mean, I think I need I, a five minute answer from you, Ryan, five minutes. <laughs> that is a massive question. I mean, I think that's why, why it's like, what man there, th these conversations need to start. Yeah. Um, and, and here's because nothing is neutral. If you look at the affections of let's, I, I jokingly say that if you took like 1963 and 2000, I did say 23, but it's now 24 as two slices of bread. Everything else in the middle makes the whole sandwich. Mm. Big old, you know, bite of, uh, you know, a, a postmodern, um, optimal, um, secular sandwich, yeah. optimized secular sandwich. And so in that sandwich, you see all kinds of ingredients that are, um, ingested and shaping our culture, you know, don't want to stretch the metaphor any further because it's going to fall apart very quickly. But um, uh, I'm on a diet right now, so everything is food. <laughs> everything. <laughs> like, I know, I know how that goes. Yeah, everything is food. But um, you can't pick what you haven't seen or heard. Yeah. If it doesn't exist, you can't pick it. So if we don't make it, then the world can't pick it, and our and our our, our believe our our bodies of believers can't either. Right. So, but what the world's been given is the sexual revolution through images and story. Um, they've been given, uh, I mean, I was even like, if you, if you were kids of the eighties, so if you took a, a strong look at how many types of cartoons and, um, shows focused on transformation in the eighties, if you took a, if you took a really close look at, this is a big one I've talked about in other podcasts, but if you look closely at Japanese, uh, anime, and you don't think the arts are effective and you, you can track the through line to anime and what you see in transgenderism now from the wow. images, the clothes to the asexuality, to the, um, the storytelling, the possessing of power, um, the shirking off of being uh, one thing or another, the, these transformative narratives into a kind of, uh, third way of querying of, of people like you can see, the seeds of that in the beginnings of Japanese anime coming here right into our homes, into our children's hearts and minds, giving them images from another culture uh, that arrested their affection so greatly that then you have subsequent you know, generations that continue to consume this stuff. And the interesting thing is that stuff becomes more diluted and dumbed down, but no less desirable to hearts that are, are, are um, beholden to it. And mm -hmm. so you see kids now, that not only want to be the characters, but the the animals that are that are, that you know are partnering with the characters. They're like I don't even need to be the anime hero. Let me just be the weird dog cat thing with my furry suit on. Well, we're yeah. so, so we're looking at from the seventies till now. Uh, uh, I'm just giving you a few examples of the way story and image has utterly arrested the imagination and the affections of of young people to where now they're doing things that we never would have imagined possible we mm. never would have believed or we would have thought this is you know so say when I, I was talking about this in 2012 you know well it's just french because the arts are french and so then you got to spend however long they'll give you to say no the arts are not french look at the clothes you're wearing aren't you glad that they don't dissolve as you're walking down the street like aren't you glad they actually work so you can be who you are like you're so immersed you can't see it and somebody had to make that stuff mm. And so nothing is neutral. So something is always saying something. It always is. And so it's been singing in chorus a counter song to the groaning creation that longs for us to play creation like an instrument and sing a gospel song in chorus. And so I think we need um, a bigger vision of of, of creation, of uh, fall. I mean, all, all of the categories, right? But then we need to see that it's urgent and we got time. And I think our church, we need to know what does it look like to start to cast a vision so that people can choose it. So, for instance, with us, you know, we're all married with kids. Uh, we've built out an institution. We Praise God, we have uh, nearing a wait list this year um, of artists coming from 
all over from Ethiopia, from Poland, uh, from different parts of the United States, uh, husbands and fathers that want to start comic book companies that are, um, they want to, they want to get in the mix to start telling stories to their kids and their grandchildren. So they're grasping the fact that this isn't going to change overnight, but if we don't start and if we just recline ourselves to a defeatist idea and mindset, well, then we're, we're shirking off a great opportunity uh, to another generation uh, who's going to have more burden possibly based on the way I think things are going right now. I'm right. very optimistic, but it doesn't. So tear down before a better build, uh, if you don't know there's a better build coming, can look very discouraging. Ooh, I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the, the storytelling thing, I think that's one that like most of us, especially with the Eschatology uh, Matters channel, that we can grasp. You know, we, we try to tell eschatology as a story um in fact I, I wrote a book i dedicated it to my kids and uh and and the reason i did was it was it was tracing stories through scripture and then trying to tell eschatology through stories because that, that is what god has written is a story and it, it doesn't take long you know we we how many shows have we tried to watch with our kids we'll get five minutes in and they're they're shocked by like why is this story so twisted why is this so weird why is it and you're turning it off like yes yeah, it's, it's garbage but it's because we've we've neglected that sense of story i think i think i've probably heard more of that come out of the christian church recently which is encouraging is a retrieval of the sense of story not as if we're making up yarns or, or telling tall tales but we're retrieving the fact that god actually is writing something cohesive mm -hmm. or, or we don't we don't have a bifurcated segmented faith this is something actually cohesive and glorifying glorifying to god and that's where you get that sense of beauty and art in it. Um, but that's a retrieval thing. Like you said, that's a realizing the waters in which we're swimming. Um, but praise God, I think in the last couple of years, I think even some in the world have realized like there's stories being told in our culture that are so radically, <laughs> radically untrue, radically contrary to what is good and true and, and lovely that it's becoming more apparent, I think. Yeah, I think so, you know, and I think that that's the thing. So like story. OK, so uh, Jesus used parables. Uh, parables render credible information. Uh, so they don't, they don't operate like a, you know, a, a, a proposition in the, you know, um, in a certain sense, but, but they, but so like poetry can, re can actually render credible information, mm. credible knowledge. So it can, it can render credible knowledge. It, stories can render credible knowledge. Lewis, you know, Lewis, um, his space trilogy deals really well with where we're at right now, rendering yeah. credible knowledge and in insight uh and even even potentially the potential to act wisely let's say all, all good gifts are from the lord right but um but no less at a minimum supportive of uh what we're talking about in the most direct sense or you get on you get on a you know a podcast with someone or you're you're talking to your congregation and you, you talk about uh that hideous strength as a reference that they can choose to uh, expedite a certain level of sensory understanding, you know, where their imagination and their their hearts and their heads and their minds are are enfolded for a moment enough to grasp um, more credibly the meaning of whatever it is you're trying to say. Let's say about the current time we're in. So mm -hmm. we like we know that these things uh, work on us. We're just we're deeply suspicious. I mean, there's church history that can be talked about. Uh, as to why I think in a real way, when you talk about the Catholic church split and the reformation, and there's so much to go into there that it's like a whole class load of content. Um, but we, you know, um, story is how, how you reach people. I mean, e every, even if you were to sit down with a designer and say, build us a logo, you'll get a lot of designers that will say, what is the story? Like walk me through the story of what you want. They'll process it as a story, you know? And so it has to fit into God's story as the the penultimate. It's the story that we're in, you know, this redemptive history. Uh, we can't escape that story. So everything everything has to work with or against that. It's really cut and dry, actually. Mm. And then we do it well or we do it okay. Um, I, I, I often say that we need to make art with and for our friends and then go make more friends. Um, you know, it's a great commission. Right. Keep it humble. Uh, he, he can bless it. Um if you stretch it, I, I don't want to get in trouble for talking about the, the chosen. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Let's just say if you had, let's just say somebody wanted to make a movie, a TV show about Jesus, and they wanted to reach a billion people and their eschatology has some dispensational leanings in it. Maybe. And so <laughs> just possibly out there. Yeah. Yeah. 
a hypothetical world, let's say. <laughs> in this hypothetical world, the temptation is to compromise the production of, uh, we're not even talking about whether it's valid or not. We're just saying, um, because your goal is, it's got to happen in my lifetime and soon, right? Mm -hmm. So we got to move to a bigger studio. We got to do, we got to keep grasping and, and we got good intention. Hey, we mean it. It's good intention. Uh, Lord's behind it. Well, I think with a better view of eschatology, you might be comfortable taking the time to make something that reaches a billion people past your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, look at look at what the Lord did with Tolkien's work or Lewis's work. I, I think I think that that's a that would be like the um, um, maybe in a, I I don't know if that's true, but I, I I see some things where you go, well, gosh, um, we're kind of at the knowledge of of good and evil here, trying to microwave it, make it happen quickly when the kingdom of heaven's like a mustard seed. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd true, but sorry, I walked right on on top either. Okay, just saying, not that we don't make it. But how much does um, great pastoral leadership bleed into folks in the congregation that maybe God has gifted to to be doing these kinds of things, this kind of work? They need to be really hemmed in, not feral cats. They need robust, like even look at the production of the show and they're searching for authorities outside of themselves to make sure that it's accurate. There's, there's a kind of a plus and a minus to that. There's like a right heartedness to say, hey, we got to have authority here theological authority here right so um you're seeing kind of a um a picture of what is and what could be i think uh in light of this conversation yeah no that's that's really good yeah and number one i'll, I'll just throw in um c.s lewis is not a sponsor of our show but that the space trilogy everybody needs to read the space trilogy i remember being told as a young man it was like oh it's boring that's great that's a great trilogy um and like you said it just speaks right to our times but but yeah it's also the um, to me, it's always buildings are always just kind of the thing that that, uh, you know, just kind of registers with me as far as as far as like a just tangible, beautiful piece of art. And it's those buildings that take generations. Yeah. I, I think for Christians, if we could just retrieve that, um, I wonder how much that would that would impact the way we engage art it, it is just that generational like you were just describing that I don't have to do this you know, in my forties, I can actually do something that will last down through the generation, something that future generations can benefit from. It doesn't have to be a microwaved immediate product here. This has been the whole, uh, I mean, think of even church planning. I don't want to go down too many like rabbit trails, but it's church planning, right? Like I, I need a mega church within five years. It's got to be self-sustaining in three years. We have churches that blow up and shrink away within a lifetime. You can see this happen as opposed to churches that may last a few generations we don't have the patience or even the vision. I don't think for that a lot of times. But and I think I, I mean I was going to bring up. So if you look at the the phenomena, you know, um, of church planning since two, let's just take two thousand and now, the the, net, the networks, all the all the stuff, right, and the ability to have online platforms and um, the temptation to so you know the the temptation for your giftings to outpace your character, mm -hmm. uh, your platform to outpace your congregation. Um, and it, it, you'll see, you'll see it time and time again, congregations buckle under the weight of a, of a, a platform that is bigger, uh, where the temptation is to tend to that more than, than this. Um, and some of that comes out of the urgency of church planning. Hey, we have a chance to get funding and money and it, it creates a self, um, fulfilling dynamic where, Hey, we got, we got to keep going. I can't say no to that. Like that's a little more opportunity. And I think that I think that you know I I don't have a perfect answer for it, but I do have like a worry or concern about it. You know, like like me and my buddies, we talk about it a lot. It's like, well, what should it look like? And um, and when you talk about church buildings, uh, church buildings have actual effects. Like think about think about a church building designed for congregational uh, singing. Yeah, or it optimizes and glorifies God. Now, is is that worth your time? Um. And it comes down to uh, richness. Is the Lord uh, so rich and and uh, kind and, and gracious to us that as we search Him out, there is something vitalizing about the richness of the Lord as He's bestowed us and poured out rich gifts on us for life and godliness? Mm -hmm. I would say yes. What people hear with that is, hey, we need to save the money. We it's it's about getting seats. It's about getting folks saved. And they they create these false dilemmas. I I think we're um, aesthetically impoverished, right? So, and if you, if if you think about what why I mean, suggestion rich impoverished, like we're 
we're missing the real work that has to be done as Christ's kingdom goes forward towards his return. There's tangible work that needs to be done. There's building of things, businesses. Um, we, we need people in every sphere with tangible vision for how these things intersect. So you take the painter and they're going to be making work specific for the building that actually is going to work specifically to achieve whatever aim it's designed to do. Um, there, that's not a problem. If we have a good understanding of created order and, and what salvation is and where it comes from by grace through faith alone and Christ alone, and what it means to gather together and scatter as, as God's people. Like if all of that's clear, then we, we need things to be working at. What, where are all the men going? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've been teaching at a university where it's 90, they shouldn't go to the university by the way, at this point, but, uh, um, but they're 95% uh, female. So um, I've been evangelizing young men that come to my door in the summer. It's about to be evangelism season where I get guys that want to sell me things in the summer. And I ask them all the same question. What's your goals in life? Wow. Um, like four or five guys last year to faith just by asking them that and then talking to them about sex and cars and how fleeting these things are once you obtain them. Wow. Yeah. And, and they're all looking to build something. Well, the church isn't leading the charge and envisioning what it looks like for builders to build something. So they're pounding the street selling bug spray mm -hmm. and to make money quickly and looking for, well, where can I go to build something? Um, where do I fit in? And so, um, you know, there, there's a, I mean, there's just a cop, there's a lot to this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, um, you, it can't be fixed overnight in my mind and I'm not um, doom and gloom about it. It's just an incredible opportunity. It's Absolutely. like the Lord has given us an incredible opportunity, but we have to be competent. We actually have to know stuff. If you don't know stuff, then you, you kind of can't teach it. And so you get a lot of um, sentimental and willy nilly culture makers and artists. They don't know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. so that's very typical of the church, which goes back to your music example. Or it becomes so populous that um, better Christian music, let's say, um, maybe if we're talking about a, like taste, uh, or creativity um, is far less accessible at a popular level. Right. Um, so that's why I say it's got to be made with and for your friends. Just go ahead and thank God for, you know, where you're at and start with what you've been given and make a good meal for your neighbors and your friends and your church body. Mm -hmm. And if, if that blesses, then the Lord will continue to bless it. And it'll probably grow um, if you cultivate it and you don't, idolize it and uh become the kinds of things that we're talking about yeah no that's that's so good because i was trying to think of a way to land the plane but I'm, I'm encouraged just that a lot of these things um again just looking back to to a meme i saw this week it was uh it was how how i thought the apocalypse was going to be or the end times or something like that and then how it actually is and on the one yeah. side you've got like the guy out you know like shooting aliens or something and on the other hand it's just the dad with his wife and kids and they're just eating dinner and having some guests over and um, a lot of this stuff, like you said, it starts in it can start in the home. Um, mm -hmm. It must start in the home and it and it can start in the home. And for for a lot of Christians, we can encourage this sort of thinking by sitting down at the dinner table, reading our kids a story, reading them the space trilogy or, you know, certainly scripture, but starting those things in the home. I think it's um, an unexpected but a palpable way uh, to advance the kingdom. Cl closing thoughts, though, Ryan, you're you about to say something. Well, I was going to say even um, so even, you know, even even like. Um, I'm working on a homeschool curriculum called Made Makers that, that'll be coming out like a year from now. But even just sitting down with little ones and, and saying, you know, you're getting your hands dirty in this finger paint and you're separate, separating out light and dark so you can form and fill the page. Right. Imagine sitting with a four-year-old and saying that to them as they're they're messing around and then showing them the scriptures. Hey, God got his hands dirty and he, and he separated out light and dark and you were made to drive out darkness. So let's start practicing driving out darkness now. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. like when you when your your kid sits down to draw a picture, they can already participate in the driving out of darkness and the telling of better stories, the shaping of things. It's all you know. It's it's all there, bound up in in Genesis. It's there for us to tease out, and we can start very very young, so that there's an integratedness to this that makes intuitive sense, um, and and sets the the frames and the the aspirational nodes for people to grow up and grab hold of it and make deeper uh, theological sense as they mature as Christians. And so that it's not really like a, a pastiche or applied thing. 
it becomes something that you just kind of grow up with understanding as a given, like making a nice meal, like uh, singing and, and praying at the dinner table, like everything else that we do that has liturgical effects. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, that's, you know, just to plug it, like, that's why we're doing the Maker Institute is we want to, we want to see, especially Reformed Christians come and, and uh, train for three years and uh, without, like, without losing hold of the things that are primary and of utmost importance, first and foremost, the church, your spouse, your kids, uh, whatever stage of life you're in, but how does this integrate into that? And how can you begin the process of, um, you know, writing better stories, painting better pictures, collaborating with people in technology and business, um, you know, major corporations get it and they're hiring creatives to observe what they're doing. I mean, an example of this for me is I got, I got asked to be before COVID the resident artist in the school of medicine, uh, at VCU working in cardiac surgery. And they want to get, let me be a clinical physician for a year observing all of their conduct with their patients. Um, like the spaces, the environments that they were in, even being able to see their reports. And at the end of a year, I would start to formulate solutions to whatever problems I perceived, both in, in how they interacted with each other as a, a doctor and patient, but also anything else that maybe could change to enhance uh, best practices. And so I think there's something right-headed about that when we're not thinking in an over-specialized way. Um, so what I'm saying is I think we need culture makers that are, are much more of a generalist mm. um, that can that can see problems in the physical world and be salt and light, drive out darkness and instantiate and create things that actually drive people to the goodness of the Lord um, as a straight line rebukes or clarifies what a curved stick is, so to speak. Yeah. No, that, that sounds almost like some of the arguments that I've, I've heard for a classical Christian education, for example, just more of a, a broad yeah, exactly. view on things. Yeah, the broad has to be there before you get. So I always tell people, don't get tripped up in the weird artist guy who's wearing a beret. Like I used to work in an art store and this this kid would bring his dad would bring his son. He was like 16 and he had like a little pencil stripe mustache. All of us were artists. You couldn't pick like I don't you couldn't pick us out as artists like we weren't. Typically, really good artists, and I'm not saying I'm a, a really good artist, but typically, just from my experience, uh, you, you, you kind of can't spot them. Right. Always the people that are like overly adorned that you're like, that person probably isn't that good. <laughs> They're over adorning themselves to kind of prove a point. So he'd wear his beret. And um, that's not that's not the vision. I mean, you, if you're in France, wear your beret, but that's not the vision of an artist. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. and it, is, it is something more holistic than particular. And what people think of is these these, these particulars that dance on the tip of a, a pinhead and they go, why well, Picasso was a weirdo. I can't, I, ah, the arts. And you're like, well, the, the scriptures kind of put art, craft and design very closely together. And we got to see that first. The funny thing is if you see that some of the weirdos start to make a little more sense because they're in context. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean, like not, not saying you have to approve or but just you will find that historically um, there was a ton of modern artists that were actually uh, on the fringe of the church. And they were trying to figure out, well, if we don't make work like Catholics because, you know, we're not um, trying to make icons of veneration. Well, how do we talk about these theological ideas? Mm. And a lot of those modern artists, uh, historians that were secular, wrote out their faith perspectives because that wasn't secular. So there, there's a there's a lot the church doesn't realize about how we got here and and what opportunities are here for us if we just grab hold of, of this this little part of our feral feral cat responsibility to you know uh, be the people of God. Wow, I, I did not have feral cats on the menu for today, but Ryan, this has been fascinating, man. This has been fascinating and encouraging. Where where can people follow you? You mentioned the the institute, uh, which is going online uh, in the fall, correct? But where can people keep up with you and what you got going on? Give all that information if you would. Yeah, so you can find. I, gosh, man, I don't even. I'm. I'm. I'm themakerinstitute.org. You can, you know, email me at Ryan at themakerinstitute.org. Um, you can look us up on on Instagram. You can type in Ryan Letario. You'll find me on Instagram um, and or my website. Uh, same same name. Um, but yeah, check out our our the thing that I think matters the right, most. That's that's L A L A U T E R I O right. Yep. Yeah, everybody. Sorry. Good. 
Yeah, no, that's it. I think the thing that matters the most right now is it's like I'm I'm good with it's like you want to see the next 10. I'm 48. So I I always feel like I got 12 good years. And then I got <laughs> I gotta be <laughs> I gotta pray that like the Lord has got I mean, I'm already looking for people to replace my role in our equation, but I got 12 years of optimal time, I think, man, before I gotta look at each year as like, you know. Time is winding down. You know I, what I, mean? I read I read a study and your 40s are your second most productive, according to this study, which I'm sure you could find another one. But your most productive decade is your 40s. You know what your first most productive decade is? What's that? 60s. Let's go. That's oh. a, that's what I'm saying, brother. Your best days are ahead. You're oh, good. Hey, I'm receiving. Uh, look at I'm taking that, <laughs> truth, man. Like I need I needed a different a different take on this. This is excellent. I, yeah. I'm easy to send that to me though, man. I need to make sure that that's that's their uh, their, their reasoning was you've got enough expertise to be really effective, and you have less burden from your workload. You can actually do what you want to do and do it really well. It was it was it was encouraging to me. I know, that, that's actually very encouraging. I I love that because uh, I, I know we I got we got to close, but. We cast such a vision. That's this is the other thing. We cast such a vision for culture making uh, to youth, which is the worst thing possible. And so, so you have people that are growing up, and not that chronologically you necessarily become wise. You know, that's not a chronological thing. That's a that's a Holy Spirit thing, Scripture thing, Christian maturity thing. Um, but we need mature Christians in their fifties and sixties to be the one telling the stories. Absolutely, we need people in their seventies to to cast the images, like who better? Like, so when I'm talking about casting a vision for the arts, I'm thinking about the whole body of Christ from, you know, little ones all the way up to eighties and nineties. My grandfather wasn't a Christian man, but he painted into his nineties and he was a porch evangelist for whatever he was doing. In other words, he could talk to anybody and everybody. And um, people could get easily wrapped up into the world that he was conjuring and creating in terms of these images and these stories and this conversation. And it's like, we need we need godly men who are not afraid to tell stories to their grandchildren, right? And, yep. and, and maybe my grandchildren, because I haven't lived the stories you've lived, but I'd love to grab hold of them so I can sit at the feet and honor those that have come before me and apply the richness of your life that Christ has given you to my grandchildren. Yeah, and could it be that we've, you know, you got Chris Wiley and others who have written on the kind of the fragmentation, the intentional societal fragmentation of the home. You have no generations ahead of you that are pumping in wisdom. Oftentimes within the Christian home, we're raised on music from 18 year olds, giving us wisdom through Christian lyrics. And then we're preached at by 23 year old mega church pastors. There's there's a lot to be said there, Ryan. I think you're something. Yeah, for sure. No, brother, this has been this has been super fun. Maybe we can do this again sometime. But uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on. And this is this has been encouraging, brother. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Honored. Seated here at my right hand.